Hey folks, this is Samuel Heber uh, here with you with another episode of Heroes of Autism. I'm here with she. I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your name again? Siobhan. Siobhan. <laughs> uh, all, all the way from England. Um, she lives a little outside of London and she is a self-love coach and on the spectrum herself. And we're going to learn a bit about both those things today. Uh, can you t start off by telling folks a bit about yourself? Yeah, so like you just said, I'm autistic myself and I'm a self-love coach. It's something I've started quite recently. So generally in my other day-to-day -day job, I'm a primary school teacher. So this is something I've just started recently to kind of help autistic people really build up their self-confidence because I know from personal experience how difficult it is when the world and everyone in it kind of tells you that you're wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. so that's just why it's become quite an important thing for me. Yeah, that's definitely one of the reasons why I do this show and all the other advocacy work that I do is, you know, we, I also grew up with a lot of people saying I'm wrong or something wrong with you. Um, but well, but this is not about me today. It's about <laughs> you. So can you tell us a bit about what it was like for you growing up with autism? Yes. Yeah, so I actually wasn't diagnosed until I was 22. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know I was autistic until then. I mean, I kind of, I thought I was, but I didn't, no, none of the doctors that I spoke to took me seriously. A lot of it down to being female and masking. Mm -hmm. So for me, generally, it was really confusing and lonely growing up just because being autistic, but not knowing you're autistic as well. Mm -hmm. presents other difficulties because you don't even know why you feel a bit different or other people respond to you like you're a little bit different mm -hmm. so it wasn't always it wasn't always a great childhood but you know for a bit of context uh what were some of those different challenges that you had as a child that were obviously because of your autistic traits yeah i think for me one of the biggest issues was just socializing so it was just so difficult to kind of play with other children to make friends to maintain those friendships mm -hmm. to understand how those friendships worked and i remember as a child having friends that probably were more bullies than friends mm -hmm. but i couldn't recognize that myself mm -hmm. having some sensory difficulties i've always been an incredibly fussy eater and like yeah mostly that kind of thing and kind of needing things a certain way ordered in a certain way mm -hmm. yeah those kind of things <laughs> Yeah, I definitely experienced it myself too about like, you know, sometimes you attract toxic friends that are really like, taking advantage mm -hmm. of you and rather than actually being your friend. And I also experienced that too, like not being able to tell the difference for years until I'm like, hey, like, why is my wallet always empty? Oh, it's because those guys keep, you know, taking yeah. my money. When they, say, when they say they'll pay me back, but they never do. Yeah. Um, taking advantage so, of you, the vulnerabilities of being autistic. Exactly. Um, yeah, because we, we we try to be we think we take everyone at their word often that mm -hmm. we assume people are honest. Um, and it takes it often takes one too many experiences to overcome that. Yeah. Um, how, speaking of overcoming it or improving, like how did you learn to socialize as you got older? Like, I, like how were you able? To, how did you go from struggling to make friends to really learning to hold on to relationships? Um, honestly, I think it's been a case of trial and error <laughs> and being burned by the fire too many times where you kind of just, I think as a child, you make so many mistakes that you quickly pick up what you should and shouldn't be doing mm. and then how to maintain friendships in that way, which is something in recent years I've tried to move away from because it, I'm sure you know yourself how mm. draining it is to be masking all the time, to be pretending to be a version of yourself that isn't actually you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it's definitely a, for those who experience it, including myself, that mask can be very, very exhausting because it, it's like, you know, for those, those that are neurotypical out there that may be watching this video, it's kind of like we're on stage all the time and like we're like method actors and we can never like break character. <laughs> yeah, I've always kind of said it feels like being an alien in, on the planet and you don't want anyone else to know that you are. So you're always having to try and mimic what the humans are doing. They mm -hmm. don't realize. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure that, but it, I'm sure that really like left a big impact on your life, those experiences. And uh, it sounds like you, instead of being bitter about it, you learn like the power of self love, which is how you overcome those childhood yeah. bullies. For people in the spectrum who go through those bad experiences, a lot of times they get stuck with a fixed mindset. Like, this is how people always are. People are always jerks and 
a holes and no it really comes from you, you examining looking at yourself and loving yourself and loving and learning from what you're doing in a situation to create it because everyone it takes two to the tango yeah um, exactly that a lot of autistic people struggle with like you said identifying you know those negative traits or being able to self-reflect and realize oh i had a part to play in that too i you know i didn't have to hand johnny my last ten ten dollars yeah know, they made that cho choice um, yeah definitely i think a lot of that's kind of self-love thing is also kind of taking responsibility for those decisions that you've made and understanding your part that you may have played in your kind of situations taking that responsibility and empowering yourself to know that you can change that and it doesn't really matter what anyone else says or thinks about you as long as you feel a certain way mm -hmm. um so you mentioned that you're a teacher um can you tell us a little bit about that like what what drove you to be a teacher and then how's that going yeah so teaching was an interesting journey for me so my degree at university i don't know if you guys do teaching a little bit different in the us but i did a degree at university in criminology and criminal justice and then did a top-up year afterwards to train as a teacher mm -hmm. so i got into teaching because i found out on my course that one of the biggest ways to stop people kind of getting involved in crime was to give them a protective factor of education because it makes such a massive difference Mm -hmm. So I decided that instead of kind of going in from the end of like police force, probation work, well, I'd rather help get the children, get the people really, when they're younger and make sure they're supported rather than chucking them in the jail cell at the end of it. Mm -hmm. If that would make sense. Uh, that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> um, because that, that's what it is in America too, that the more educated we are on our rights and the way things are, the less likely we're we'll getting in jail. Um, and, I guess, and then you became a teacher. Um, what grade do you teach? Um, I teach primary, so here I can kind of teach from age five up to 11. So at the moment I'm teaching kind of nine. So nice in the middle. I'm not sure what grade that is in your, in America. You I was a bit nine? confused. You said nine? Yeah, so it's year uh, four here. All right, is that high school, nine? Oh. No, so our school system's a little bit different here. So we have primary school, which children start at age five and up to age 11. And then we have secondary school that they do 11 till 16 or 18, or you can go to college to do 16 to 18. And then we go to university at 18. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so how old are the kids that you work with now? Mine are nine. Gotcha. Um, so um, what's it like being an autistic teacher? Because usually we, th we think of people like you and me as the students, but not being in a position of like teacher or power. Like how, how, how's that going for you? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. I mean, I enjoy it. It's something I've been doing for kind of like, I've been in education now for about four to five years in various different roles. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a challenging, I mean, it's challenging at the most best of times for people without autism. So adding in additional kind of sensory aspects to it and the amount of socialising that goes into it. I mean, children are generally a lot easier to socialise with because you don't have the kind of, they're not going to play games with their communication as much as adults. But when you have like parents evening, for example, and then parents take your blunt responses as being rude or those kind of things can get in the way. But generally, yeah, adults are normally the issue rather than the children. Mm. I, I get that because children are often like very blunt, like how autistic people do talk. Because um, I was a teacher's assistant for eight years, so that's one of the things I learned to really appreciate about kids is like straight to the point and no games mm -hmm. or no, you should just know. Yeah. No, not, none of those guessing games. Um, so you mentioned like sens sensor issues. Like what happens when you're having like a sensory overload in the classroom? Do you step out for a minute or is there tricks that you've learned to be like all right i'm, t I'm teaching math right now i, I can't <laughs> have, have this meltdown um i've been quite lucky so far that i haven't really had any sensory overloads as a teacher i definitely had them as a ta when i would normally just try and find myself a quiet place in the building but i think one of the things that makes it a little bit easier being a teacher is that i'm in control of the classroom rather than being in someone else's classroom mm -hmm. so if i need that noise quieter it's going to be quieter rather than kind of going off what the teacher's doing or what the other pupils are doing. It's my classroom, I'm in control of that kind of stuff. 
Mm. So I think it's one of those things just being prepared. Like I'm very aware when I have sensory issues or I know that, for example, if there's too many children talking, I can't hear their answers clearly. Mm-hmm. So then I have to plan for that and make sure that that kind of my being autistic isn't impacting on their learning. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like what you do is like, uh, too many kids are talking, you advocate by saying, all right, class, um, time to quiet down, I need one at a time. Um, and that's something that a lot of autistic people, you know, struggle with, like knowing when to advocate. But I think that you illustrated it perfectly. It's when you know that too many kids talking is too distracting for you to actually concentrate on what you're doing. Uh, it's just similarly just being very d- direct, especially as a teacher, as a taking that leadership role. Um, so how have you, and then you mentioned about parents night, like that you are very blunt and rude. Um, how, how have you learned to better communicate with parents and not in, I guess, be more elaborate in your way you talk to them rather than just your, your kid's great A's or, um, his writing's just not so good. Basically, how don't I offend them? <laughs> Yes, how don't, how don't you offend them or learn to not offend them? I think I end up, to be honest, just using, I don't like to say I do this because it kind of feeds into the masking thing, but I intend to end up using a script when I'm talking to parents. So in my meetings, they'll basically sound the exact same for every single parent, except the information for that particular child will be changed. But then it's just easier to be in control of the answers I'm going to get back from parents or have more control of the conversation because I've known from the last 15 kind of what answers I'm likely to get back from different things and you kind of start to know the parents and what things they do and don't want to hear and how you do and don't need to approach that. Mm. I think that's a brilliant you know method. I don't think that's exactly putting a mass. It's making your thinking visual um because autistic people are visual thinkers like having the answers and knowing what to expect it helps you feel confident and control. And that's what I in my experience with parents, that's what they want to see that person taking care of the child, teaching their child is confident. Um, so I, 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 I applaud your strategy rather than be like, oh, like it's, that sucks you to put on a mask. It's not a mask. It's just like a way to funnel your, and, and a very logical way to figure out what parents need to hear. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, you know, keep doing it. And that, that's the key for all of my ASPE friends out there who are watching this video that the more you visual, make your work visual, the the easier it's going to go, the more confident you're going to be with it. Um, Mm -hmm. So my next question for you is, how did your life experiences lead to you being a self-love coach? What's more, what what the heck is a self-love coach? (laughs) So my experience kind of led me down this path, just because it sounds a bit cliche, but I still really don't really want anyone else to feel how I felt. Like it being undiagnosed for so long with so many mental health issues for me, like, I'm I'm okay now and I'm functioning okay now but me kind of eight years ago was not the same picture and a lot of it was just to do with how the world had treated me and how I felt about myself and I just wanted to make sure that no one else ever felt that way again and I feel like we get so many messages bombarded us all the time that we need to be cured we need to be fixed or we need this or we need that and it's just I yeah I just don't think it's fair that we should have to feel like we're a problem we're actually we're just different it's just a different processing system it's not a broken one it's just not the same as other people mm-hmm. that's right exactly it's just like just because you put a playstation video game in an xbox it doesn't work doesn't mean it's broken you just gotta put it in the right system yeah. exactly so it's just making sure that we're supporting people in the way that works for them which is why i think the self-love comes in because it's really it's really easy as a, as a non-autistic NT person to kind of say to an autistic person, oh, you know, you shouldn't feel this way. Like, that's great, but you've never felt how I felt. And you would generally never have that understanding, even if you have an autistic sibling, a cousin, whatever, mum, dad, you'll never really understand how it feels to be autistic unless you are. Which is why I thought it was important to have someone who was autistic helping other autistic people to grow their confidence back, to get that self-love back. because you know you only get one life you're only going to ever be yourself so you might as well love yourself the best you can and get the best outcome for yourself which mm-hmm. only you can get yeah exactly because everything comes from you like every life experience like you have the power to change your life and if you're mm-hmm. always going to be down on yourself you're 
are not going to go very far that, you know, you're, we, the, I'm talking the ones that are like still in my parents' basement, 30 years old, like, oh, I should have peaked in college. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way to climb out of your parents' basement and out of all that negative thinking is through self-love. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So what does self-love on a day-to-day -day look like for you? So, so we can give our Aspie brothers and sisters a more clear picture of what self-love looks like through an autistic perspective. For me, I think it's making sure I'm doing those things to look after myself, so making sure I'm not being great at the moment, the whole lockdown thing, but making sure I'm being active, making sure I'm eating the right stuff, trying to drink enough water. So those kind of physical things, but then also I check my thinking quite a lot. So if I'm saying something in my brain, I'm kind to myself. I do kind of question myself, like, why are you saying that? Where did that come from? Is that helping you? Is that going to help us get to where you want to? Thinking like it, is this decision I'm about to make the decision my best self would make? If not, why am I making it? Because it's not going to help me. And if it is, then great, let's carry on with it. Mm -hmm. And just being, I think it's just being kind to yourself. Imagine yourself as your best friend. What would you tell your best friend to do? And how would you communicate with them? That's how you should be communicating with yourself daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am right on with everything you said. And to sum it up, folks, it's kind of like taking the golden rule, which everyone knows, treat others the way you want to be treated but turning that inward and treat yourself the way you want to be treated. Yeah, exactly. And I liked how you use the analogy of, you know, if you were own best friend, what would you, what would you say? Like, you know, give yourself advice. Like that advice is in you. That knowledge is in you because you were able to give it to another person. So give it to yeah, yourself. Exactly. Yeah. You, you are your best friend. You're the only friend that you're going to have for every single day of your life. So you might as well treat yourself like it. Mm -hmm. Exactly um let's see uh what tips can you give uh my audience in particular young aspies between 20 to 30 there us and they're in their own apartment they have their first job but they're really struggling to take care of themselves what are some things that you have found living on your own and working uh that really help fill your cup and practical sense I use a lot of apps on my phone so I use a lot of organizing apps to do list apps I use widgets on my phone because like you said yourself about how visual things are I'm more, I also have ADHD so if I am not seeing something quite a lot there's a good chance that I'm probably going to forget about it so I try to use a lot of widgets on my home screen to keep me reminding of things I use my to-do apps I'm quite one of my special special interests is organization anyway but I really do push the importance of organization just because it makes you feel more confident if you know what you've got to get done this week, then yeah. you can allot time that you need for it. You can allot your rest time that you might need afterwards. You can plan if there's any sensory difficulties that come from those activities. That would just be my best advice. And just be your authentic autistic self. Like we've gotten into such a awkward place in society where we feel like we can't be ourselves. We have to be this normal version of ourselves. But actually, that's never going to be you, and it's always kind of going to impact you negatively to be that version of you. So just be your beautiful, authentic, autistic self. Mm. The right people will love you for it, and if people people that don't aren't your right people, so don't let them impact how you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. Because that and that, that's how I really learned to navigate the world too. As you said, and another way to look at it is if your autism doesn't bother you, it won't bother other people, mm -hmm. and then. You know, it really comes down to how you react to what any other person's doing, including what you're doing yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so how ha ha have you been able to learn to self-reflect? Because it sounds like early on in your childhood, you couldn't tell that, you know, so someone was toxic or not. Like, um, how did you get up to the point where, like, I can recognize, okay, this person is not really a friend. They're really just, you know, after looking for me to pay for drinks or... Uh, do my work, do their work for for them, or or the reverse. This friend is there for me when I'm having a really rough time. Uh, this friend, you know, is a you know, ride or die friend. You know, we have a lot of laughs together. We have a lot of shared interests. You know, you're a real friend. Um, how did you go from your the way you looked at that as a child to now, where you're able to tell the difference between the two? Mm -hmm. I think. And a lot of it is through experience and just kind of recognizing what behaviors like would, would I do that to someone else and if I wouldn't do what someone's doing to someone else 
So if someone's doing something to me, if I wouldn't do that to someone else, then I'll recognize that that's not something that maybe should be being done to me. But I also try to use a lot, it sounds a bit cheesy to say it, but kind of pro, pro and con lists of relationships and thinking, you know, what is this person bringing into my life? What am I bringing into theirs? Is this actually a beneficial trade-off or is it not? And being quite honest with myself and that kind of self-reflective, like you said, kind of attitude to it really, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you, the fact that you put yourself on, on that list because I've seen a lot of therapists here in America who do the pros and cons, and, but they always forget to include the individual. It's like, all right, if you want to know this is a good person, like write pros and cons, like you said, but they never include what, hey, what do I bring to this? Like, is this beneficial? Oh, yeah. Like, that's the that, thing. Can... That's Sorry, the... Karim. Sorry. Um, that's one of the huge things I think missing in, in the way America teaches autistic people how to socialize. Is that there's this give and take, give and take, and um, and that that's a huge secret to forming deep relationships. Instead, like there's this idea that autistic people can't form deep, meaningful uh, relationships, and or it takes us, but in truth, it just takes us a little longer to to do that. Um, yeah, it does take us a little bit, a bit longer. I do find sometimes we do struggle a bit with the two-wayness of a relationship. Mm -hmm. But I think in some ways, like I don't know if you would agree yourself, but I would say a lot of my friendships that I have are probably deeper friendships than a lot of general people have. So I don't have that level of kind of acquaintance friends. Someone's mm -hmm. either my friend or they're not. I don't really have that superficial mm -hmm. level of friendships with anybody. It's just my friends are actually deep friends. A lot of them are friends that I've had for years. I don't know if that's a similar experience for you. Yeah, I think it really is uh, uh, for me because, like, there are too many, like, I've written social rules with acquaintances, like, how friendly you can be with them versus someone who's actually your friend, like, you know, know like, how friendly you can be or um, the other aspects of being someone's friend, like, that all or nothing, it, it just makes socializing so much easier for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then off screen, we talked talked about um you have a, pro a program i think it was like a six-week program yeah um and folks these are this is gonna be really good because often we people hear people like me and her talk, talking like this and like how do we get there and i think this program may just help people like us get there so can you tell us a bit about that yeah so i obviously it's, an, it's a new business for me this kind of self-love coach um experience so what I'm thinking, I'm launching. I'm just saying, I'm, so I'm doing a free launch for a six week program where I work with, it's generally autistic women. So I don't, I'm happy to speak to people who aren't women as well, but it's generally a service for women. Just to spend six weeks working with me as equal partners, just to see how we can address your goals and kind of build your self-confidence and feel empowered to chase those things that you want to chase and just it it's kind of hard to describe i guess but it's just a program to help you reach your goals and find ways that are autistic friendly for you personally to meet those goals rather than the kind of standard neurotypical advice that you get for meeting goals and feeling good about yourself and loving yourself mm, so I guess walk us through each week. So it's it's week one. Yeah. So week one would kind of look at your core values and understanding what's important to you. So from there, we can kind of pull out those main themes and look at goals that might relate to those. Because the closer your life is to those things that are important to you, the better you feel within yourself. And then the second week, from those goals that we've picked out on the first week, we're going to more depth and detail figuring out an uh, initial plan for how we're going to meet the goals, coming up with those steps, coming up with maybe plans to back up the steps if they don't work, if, if you kind of have trouble with them, or let's say, for example, you're having a difficult sensory day. And then the next kind of week, three, four, five, we're kind of be checking in on those goals, checking in on how those steps are working out, if there's anything that needs to be changed, keeping you motivated, discussing any issues that you're having with the goals. If there's anything that you feel more, you're finding more difficult talk about how you're feeling about yourself how it feels to kind of be making those uh, the words on the tip of my tongue kind of making those steps towards working towards your best self really 
And then your final week in week six would just be talking about the goals, how you whether you've reached them or if there's something you're working to in the long term, how you can carry on implementing those steps to make sure you reach your successful stage. And then we have a kind of catch up call kind of week eight just to see how it's going and see if those steps are in place, if there's any additional support you can get from me. It's all really, to be honest, just about helping people understand the steps they can take to get towards the best life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is sorely needed in the autism community because um, because we are such um, visual uh, thinkers, like we always see like the uh, end result and think, oh, I'll never get there, but not realizing that like, People that we look up to had to take all these baby steps to get there and a lot of yeah, exactly. failure a failure along the way and they, but they learn from their failures and um and we can get there too and i think that's a huge thing is also being realistic about our goals so often i'm guilty of this myself of setting these grandioso um uh, goals <laughs> yep what ends up happening with grandioso goals is kind of like you never you set yourself up to fail nine times out of ten. Yeah, like, so it's yeah. Oh, there's like, you. you didn't realize that there's like fifty million steps, and then you're like, there's no way with my ADD and uh, the limited time I have to accomplish that. So yeah, exactly. How, so that being said, um, sounds like by your reaction, you experienced that too. Like you set these grandioso goals for yeah. yourself, and then you basically. I think you sound like you agree with me that you set yourself up to fail. Like, how, so how do, does someone on the spectrum create a realistic goal that actually is doable? To be honest, I would. My first recommendation would be if you're a bit concerned that your goal is not realistic, I would kind of use a mind map to map out the steps that you would take to work towards that goal. Even do it as month per month until you get to that goal, just to see if there's steps that actually do work for you. So, for example, if your goal is in a month to be an amazing public speaker, do you actually have enough space in a month to make all those steps? If you do, great. But if you don't, then be a little bit more realistic with yourself. Okay, well, maybe I'll be a great public speaker in six months. So then you've got more space for those steps to be spread along, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense that, like, you know, as the old story goes, the, the Taurus always wins the race because mm -hmm. uh, patience is the is learning to really it teaches you everything like if you just wait a little longer that plant will grow if you wait a little longer you'll get that job even if it takes you a few years to achieve either uh th thing it it's possible and that's i think a huge thing that needs to be taught in school things like self-love do you try to teach self-love in your classroom at all yes so yeah so self-love self-confidence and even like emotional literacy the children have a better understanding of how they emotionally feel because they have a wider vocabulary to describe their feelings. So that's even something that you could kind of you could go over in coaching as well. If you felt like you didn't know how to communicate with your emotions clearly, mm -hmm. I mean, we could discuss different words that you could use if you weren't sure how to describe it. Mm -hmm. And a lot, a lot of the time, people like especially when talking with autistics, you don't know how to describe you how you feel often because you don't actually have a word for it. So the more expansive vocabulary you have for emotional literacy that's a big help as well mm -hmm. that's really amazing in america we, we don't do that i mean like in our autistic specialized schools we do have certain therapies that are geared to that but it often doesn't come from the teacher themselves um so if you if you have any advice for teachers out there that are teaching autistic children or um how would you teach uh, emotional uh, conversations and intelligence in, in your classroom for those that are looking for tips? Yes, yeah, so I think it'd be kind of having those role play conversations. And I think with autistic children in particular, I mean, I don't work in a school for autistic children, but I have taught autistic children. I think it's understanding that that, is in, that child is a functioning autistic child and you need to meet their needs, not them needing to meet yours. So making sure you ask them, you know, how could I help you with this? What is it that you find difficult? Don't assume for them that they find something difficult. Ask them. Ask them if there is anything they need help with. There's nothing worse than seeing a teacher. I've seen it quite a lot, actually, to be honest, kind of trying to force an autistic pupil to make eye contact with them because the teacher thinks they should be doing that because that's the teacher's need. 
but actually it's not the autistic child's needs a lot of the time you've just completely ruined their focus for the day or their ability to hear you so i think it's being aware of autism when you're teaching and thinking of the child's needs first mm -hmm. rather than what you need or what the rest of the class needs they line up as a teacher how hard that is with emotional literacy i think again it's that expansive vocabulary and modeling it for children so kind of saying oh do you know what i'm feeling a little bit blue today is anyone else feeling this way oh, okay so what could we do to cheer ourselves up what could we do to feel better about ourselves and kind of having that in your general daily conversation with your class mm -hmm. yeah i think that's definitely like because we are, are the model to our children in my experience in the teaching in the classroom that's definitely mm -hmm. it's you want to also do a very situational uh i think emotional literature like in the moment because Often for autistic children, the struggle is like is thinking in the abstract, and yeah. we often are like, okay, I'm when when is the time to express myself? It's not mm -hmm. when 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 my teacher's in the middle of doing math. Um, okay, she didn't hear me. Let me tear apart the classroom. No, it's you know as the teacher's showing them. Okay, during this time and this time, you can point to the clock. This is when we can talk about our feelings. Or yeah. you're, you're having a really hard time, you know, ask for for a go for a walk in the hall, like learning to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the huge thing that I would want teachers who don't really know autism to understand. And help yeah, I agree. Um, so going back to your six-week program, is this an online thing? Uh, is this a group class? Is this a one-on-one -on -one thing? Um, yeah, so it's one-to-one. -one. Very cool. Uh, is it geared towards um, autistic people or just people in general? Autistic people and other people who are neurodiverse, so people with ADHD or dyspraxia, dyslexia, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really cool. I, I did a bit of uh, life coaching um, myself and it definitely is an interesting experience uh, like taking adults on the spectrum out into the community and teaching them to advocate and you know love themselves and mm -hmm. um so what are your clients like if you've ha had any like what's been your experience so far as a self-love coach so i haven't had any clients so far but i've spoken to quite a lot of women on the spectrum obviously it's, it's generally for autistic women but i also help run a facebook group for autistic women in the uk as well so I've got quite a lot of background experience of seeing how different women who are autistic are feeling and a lot of the issues that are arising from being autistic as a woman. But there's a lot of obviously different layers of societal pressures that maybe males who are autistic don't get the same kind of pressures that females do. That's really interesting and that's something I've interviewed actually quite a few autistic women at this point. Um, but I'm curious to hear from you. What, uh, have you been learning about these women? Like, what are the struggles for autistic women the, these days as young women are on the spectrum? I think, to be honest, one of the biggest issues is just it's just people don't think you exist. So, because we have the the, the kind of ratios of autism touted as like it was originally sixteen boys to one girl, and it's come down to about four boys to one girl, you generally get a lot of people not believing you. And even people do believe you, they're quite dismissive of you, which is actually a general issue society, societal for women with medical concerns, not being listened, not being taken seriously. I mean, I personally had to speak to four doctors, I think it was, before someone actually took me seriously, that I might be autistic and agreed to refer me for an assessment. Mm -hmm. My first doctor laughed at me when I told him. So there's a lot of issues in that sense. And then that becomes quite an invalidating thing, because then you do start to question am i is this right like is this actually my identity but you know i think women generally kind of can get a little bit more insecure about that kind of thing as well because you are being questioned a lot more then you obviously have the additional pressures of your if you're if you have children i don't but if you have children you're more likely to be the caregiver of children mm -hmm. you're more likely to have additional roles around the household like women do i think it's about 60 to 70 percent more household chores than men do so having to fit that in as well and there's all these additional pressures that it becomes almost like a boiling pot because you can't process it all and you can't do it all in a way that's healthy for you mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think the issue that really comes across is that we're often, I've seen like, t and talking to other guests, they say that people talk to them like their their, their children once they find out they're autistic. Um, I had one uh, guest who like because when she was giving birth that she didn't respond the way people normally respond to pain. They thought she was faking it. Um, mm -hmm. And yep. that's definitely a huge problem, you know, problem because autism, from what I've seen in these interviews and as a teacher of autistic kids, like there are differences. And the other part is that women, from what I understand, their language part of their brains is highly developed, so it's easier for them to mask their autistic traits. and um, because they already have really heightened social skills, they can at least fake being social a lot easier than autistic boys. Um, and it also seems like a, a, a lot of the times that women don't get diagnosed until their early 20s because no one's taking them seriously. Um, that being said, what do you think doctors should be looking for in aut autist when a woman comes to them and is like, I may be autistic? Like, what, in your opinion, what should they be looking for? I think they should just listen. I'd be I'd be happy with them just actually listening to the woman, to be honest. Because I know I was misdiagnosed before I was diagnosed being autistic. I spent two years in a group therapy that I didn't need to be in. I was put on multiple antidepressants and anti-anxiety tablets and sleeping tablets that I didn't need to be on. So I would just like them to listen to us, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's the hugest thing uh, that I'll not just autistic women, but autistic people in general re re realize that the thing that they want most is to be heard. And, and, the, and the big thing is speaking up, which is really hard because a lot of us have major social anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and also the fact that we struggle to make eye contact and we stress out about not making eye contact. But at the same time, we're trying to listen to that person. Mm -hmm. um, it can be really challenging. Um, so how, how would you encourage someone on the spectrum, um, especially a, a woman who just found out like she's pregnant and she, and she doesn't like the way she's being treated in the hospital. How, what advice would you give her? My, I would, if she's on her own, I would recommend her seeing if anyone could come and be with her. So she's not on her own in the hospital. And if there's anyone who can, if she's feeling anxious for whatever reason, there's someone who can advocate with her. If, to be honest, if it was something quite serious, I would recommend putting in a formal complaint because doctors do treat us quite terribly. But I would just make sure that, she, to be honest, my advice would be feeling empowered enough in yourself to stand up for your needs and your rights, especially if you're pregnant and having, about to have a baby. You know, you need to feel that you're important enough and you're valid enough that you know that your needs need to be met. Regardless of what anyone thinks, they have to be met. So... Mm -hmm. Just being empowered enough in yourself, and I know it's I know it's so much easier to say it than it is to do it. Mm -hmm. But just know that you're important and valid enough that if something isn't going the way you expect, or it's not going a way that helps you, tell them, get them to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the power of self advocacy. All you have to do is say no, as you're mm -hmm. an adult, you can, or yes to whatever you you do need. Hospitals do have to meet and know your rights. It's a big thing I learned. Uh, in a previous video where I talked about with an autistic woman about what it was like to be pregnant and her, you know, her struggles with that. Um, the other shift, you know, what about at the workplace? Like my boss isn't taking me seriously. Uh, they, aren't, they aren't taking what I need to thrive my job seriously, even though I have documented proof that um, I need these accommodations in order to thrive. Um, at the workplace, what would you tell um, a autistic woman who's tr trying to advocate for herself at work and is really struggling? If she's struggling to advocate for herself at work, I would tell her to go and speak to her HR department. If, if her company are, will know that she has the accommodations and they're not enacting them, I would go to her HR department, even if you need to email them about it, because that's an easy way for you to communicate. Do that. like. Advocate for yourself in whatever way works for you. If HR insists that you go and see them face to face, say, look, one of my accommodations might be communication by written means is easier for me. So can you meet that accommodation? Because that's what I need. 
if it wasn't if it's more kind of getting accommodations i know that could be a bit trickier i don't know what the legalities around accommodations are like in the us but i know here we have quite stringent laws that they're not always followed so that's why that hr thing and going to speak to someone higher up if they, your accommodations aren't being met Again, it ties back into that validity, knowing that you're valid, knowing that you're important enough that these things need to be met for you to be successful. Mm -hmm. And no, feeling, I don't know, empowered enough that that's important to you. So you know that needs to be fixed for you to be as successful as you can be. Everyone else doesn't need those things to be successful. But that doesn't mean that you should be quiet about needing them to help you. It means that you should have more, more importance in getting them, I guess. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And to put this in a better picture for you guys, like even there are people who people need uh, accommodations to do the work. They need light. They need computers that work. They need a place to put their lunch. They need pens. They need paper. Like they, they need things in order to accomplish the work. And making a request for dimmer lights and stuff um, is, is basically the same thing as them requesting, I need more pens. Mm -hmm. that by law in this is in america and it sounds like in england they have to accommodate you now they, you can't have like fur, wear fuzzy slippers and have a big screen tv in your office because it helps you concentrate to have tv in the background or uh, but there are smaller ways to accommodate like extra time to complete a task uh, yeah nice place to work um it's just steps to ensure your success really isn't it mm -hmm. and the and the biggest thing i also advocate to my clients who ask similar questions to, to what we're talking about it's about like i keep i said earlier if your autism doesn't bother you it shouldn't bother other people if it does mm -hmm. that may not be the right place for you to work you want exactly. a boss that's going to actually like doctors should listen to you now you can't tell them what to do because they're the boss but um you you can make suggestions the way that you can thrive and do your work in a more effective way um yeah. so another big thing that i i want to help help you with is how to get get you some clients hopefully through this program mm -hmm. uh, if someone wants to sign up for your six-week program if someone wants to just talk to you as we're talking today how can they do that yeah, just come over to my Instagram account, so it's infinitely autistic, and you can send me a direct message and we can talk about it there. And then we can get you signed up. And it'll be launching sometime in the next week. So then you'll see a post come up with all the information as well. And then you can just speak to me about the more uh, the details. Sorry, I'm getting a bit tongue tied now. The details of everything. Mm. All right, that is awesome. And I always like to end Heroes of Autism with the following question If you could change the way the world sees autism, what would it be in one way and why? Um, I think it ties back into what I said earlier, what we agreed on. I would just like the world to see autism as a different processing software rather than it being a broken software. Because I'm just fed up, to be honest, of us always being told that we're not right or that we're wrong or that we're broken, that we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, just fed up with that narrative. Mm. Hey Amen. I am definitely fed up with that too, because we're not broken, we're different. And exactly. one thing I always point out is the way the world is would not be the way it is without autistic people that we've been around since the dawn of time. Like without us, we wouldn't have the iPhone or Microsoft or Pokemon or mm -hmm. um, the pioneers of the world. A lot of the music, John Lennon from England from the, on the spectrum, we wouldn't have the Beatles without the autistic <laughs> mind. Um, Tim Burton, we wouldn't, ha wouldn't have the you know that what, what he does and einstein and tesla like we've been sh shaping the way the world works facebook the thing that everyone uses was made by an autistic person so he could socialize you know yeah. mark zuckerberg has proved that we want to socialize we want to connect that we can do things we, we just do it a different way facebook yeah, is all about it. visual communication anyway that's that's autistic language right there Mm -hmm. everyone now knows how to use yeah um so i think that's really awesome and i hope you, you know you get some clients and we see more you. of your awesome because i think self-love is the most important lesson for autistic adults especially because 
Yeah, I agree. We went through our programs. We learned how to socialize on a basic level, but to take it to the next level, to thrive, we need to learn to love ourselves and get rid of yeah. the narrative of the things that people said we couldn't never do and for, focus on the things that we can do and, mm -hmm. and do it our, our own way. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Doing it in a way that works for you, not the way that works for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth of being an independent adult, which is what our parents want for us and that's what we want for ourselves to be independent. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you so much for coming on my show, no, Cures you. of Autism. Um, it's been a lot of fun and I hope that um, this message helps some teachers out there, some uh, young Aspies out there, or even some older ones. Um, please comment below. Let's keep the conversation going. Please subscribe. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this thank is you for me. Uh, signing out of Heroes of Autism. Hey folks, this is Samuel Heber uh, here with you with another episode of Heroes of Autism. I'm here with she, I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your name again? Siobhan. Siobhan. <laughs> uh, all, all the way from England. Um, she lives a little outside of London and she is a self-love coach and on the spectrum herself. And we're going to learn a bit about both those things today. Uh, can you t start off by telling folks a bit about yourself? Yeah, so like you just said, I'm autistic myself and I'm a self-love coach. It's something I've started quite recently. So generally in my other day-to-day -day job, I'm a primary school teacher. So this is something I've just started recently to kind of help autistic people really build up their self-confidence because I know from personal experience how difficult it is when the world and everyone in it kind of tells you that you're wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. so that's just why it's become quite an important thing for me. Yeah, that's definitely one of the why I do this show and all the other advocacy work that I do is, you know, we, I also grew up with a lot of people saying I'm wrong or something wrong with you. Um, but what, but this is not about me today. It's about <laughs> you. So can you tell us a bit about what it was like for you growing up with autism? Yes. Yeah, so I actually wasn't diagnosed until I was 22. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know I was autistic until then. I mean, I kind of, I thought I was, but I didn't, no, none of the doctors that I spoke to took me seriously. A lot of it down to being female and masking. Mm -hmm. So for me, generally, it was really confusing and lonely growing up just because being autistic, but not knowing you're autistic as well, mm -hmm. presents other difficulties because you don't even know why. You feel a bit different. Other people respond to you like you're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't always a great childhood. but. Mm -hmm. You know, for a bit of context, uh, what were some of those different challenges that you had as a child that were obviously because of your autistic traits? Yeah, I think for me, one of the biggest issues was just socializing. So it was just so difficult to kind of play with other children, to make friends, to maintain those friendships, mm -hmm. to understand how those friendships worked. And I remember as a child having friends that probably were more bullied than friends but I couldn't recognize that myself. Mm -hmm. Having some sensory difficulties, I've always been an incredibly fussy eater. And like, yeah, mostly that kind of thing and kind of needing things a certain way, ordered in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, I definitely experienced it myself too about like, you know, sometimes you attract toxic friends that are really like, taking advantage mm -hmm. of you than rather than actually being your friend I also experienced that too, like not being able to tell the difference for years until I'm like, hey, like, why is my wallet always empty? Oh, it's because those guys keep, you know, taking yeah. my money. When they, say, when they say they'll pay me back, but they never do. Yeah. Um, taking advantage so, of using the vulnerabilities of being autistic. Exactly. Um, yeah, because we, we, we try to be, we, th we take everyone at their word often, that mm -hmm. we assume people are honest. Uh, and it takes uh, often takes a one too many experiences to overcome that. Yeah. Um, how, speaking of overcoming it or improving, like how did you learn to socialize as you got older? Like, I, like how were you able? To, how did you go from struggling to make friends to really learning to hold on to relationships? Um, honestly, I think it's been a case of trial and error <laughs> and being burned by the fire too many times, where you kind of just. I think as a child, you make so many mistakes that you quickly pick up what you should and shouldn't be doing mm. and then how to maintain friendships in that way, which is something in recent years I've tried to move away from because it, I'm sure you know yourself. 
how draining it is to be masking all the time, to be pretending to be a version of yourself that isn't actually you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it's definitely a, for those who experience it, including myself, that mask can be very, very exhausting because it, it's like, you know, for those, those that are neurotypical out there that maybe watch this video, it's kind of like we're on stage all the time and like we're like method actors and we can never like break character. <laughs> Yeah, I always kind of said it feels like being an alien in on the planet and you don't want anyone else to know that you are. So you're always having to try and mimic what the humans are doing. They mm. don't realise. Right. Yeah, and I'm sure that but it, I'm sure that really like left a big impact on your life, those experiences. And uh, it sounds like you instead of being bitter about it, you learn like the power of self love, which is how you overcome those childhood yeah. bullies for people on the spectrum go through those bad experiences a lot of times they get stuck with a fixed mindset like this is how people always are people are always jerks and a-holes and no it really comes from you, you examining looking at yourself and loving yourself and loving and learning from what you're doing in a situation to create it because everyone it takes two to the tango yeah um, exactly that a lot of autistic people struggle with like you said identifying you know those negative traits or being able to self-reflect and realize, oh, I had a part to play in that too. I, you know, I didn't have to hand Johnny my last ten ten dollars. Yeah, know, they made that cho choice. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think a lot of that kind of self-love thing is also kind of taking responsibility for those decisions that you've made and understanding your part that you may have played in your kind of situations. Taking that responsibility and empowering yourself to know that you can change that. And it doesn't really matter what anyone else says or thinks about you, as long as you feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. Um. So you mentioned that you're a teacher. 